A word about me first. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Ivan, which is a database as a service company. We operate in pretty much all the public clouds. And previously, I used to work on large-scale databases and distributed systems. Uh, I'm also the maintainer for a bunch of open source projects, mostly around Postgres. Uh, these days, not that active anymore, but still doing uh, something every now and then when time permits. Uh, then a word about Ivan, uh, just so you know where we're coming from. Uh, we basically uh, are a company that operates databases globally uh, in six uh, different cloud providers in 89 different regions around the world. Uh, there's eight different open source data engines or messaging systems that we provide. And we started off in early 2016 by providing a managed Postgres uh, service. Uh, while we are not like a hyperscaler like Google or AWS, we still operate at a, a pretty uh, fierce scale. Um, some definitions uh, before we get into the uh, meat of the matter. Uh, stateful systems, they typically hold important things, namely the state of your system. Uh, that, and that is what also makes them slightly uh, different from stateless systems, which are really easy to restart, really easy to move around. Uh, this is, by the way, where typically systems like Kubernetes have been at their strongest, as in uh, like stateless systems, you can easily, easily just stop or restart or have, uh, start running in a pod somewhere else. But in the case of stateful systems, there's plenty of data, and the more data you have, the harder it gets to actually manage them. Uh, there's also lots of considerations around durability and accidental changes to the data, and what the, those are the kind of things that you really don't want to see happening accidentally. As for immutable infrastructure, uh, it's basically a paradigm where servers, once they're actually running, they are never actually changed afterwards. Uh, basically, the idea behind this is to make uh, your deployments more consistent and reliable because you're always doing it the same way. Uh, so historically, um, if people uh, deployed a service and then they went manually to uh, change something in the configuration, eventually if you had, uh, let's say, 100,000 uh, machines, they, none of them actually looked the same as the others. So uh, while there have been lots of different uh, uh, deployment automation tools uh, for this sort of thing, uh, typically they still, still start differing over time. Uh, in order to do this, I'm going to go through some of the tooling we have, but you uh, pretty much need a, quite a bit of automation tooling around this because operating at this at a scale is otherwise uh, kind of hard. Um, anyway, uh, I'll take us back to like early 2015 when we started writing our platform. Uh, basically, a lot of our team had background in using Debian in different companies where we had worked previously. Uh, Basically, Debian at that time uh, had had its issues with uh, slow release cycles, and basically because of that, a lot of people were using backported packages. Like uh, we had been backporting tons and tons of things, so one of the things we knew, um, like out of the gate, it was that we really didn't want to backport stuff. At least we didn't want to backport system components, which would have basically meant rebuilding the whole thing. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do is um, a corollary that is basically something that worked really close to the upstream project. So typically, that uh, when you made a bug report, uh, actually the stuff would get upstreamed whenever the fix went in. And also, uh, back then, there was still the hula baloo around systemd uh, integration into Debian. And uh, like that was something that we actually wanted to use already back then. Um, Debian has a reputation for being stable. Uh, I've added this in quotation marks, but uh, uh, I'll get to that later. Uh, but it has uh, many positives, as in the open source free software ethos is really strong around that community. Uh, there's no single controlling company around Debian. It's basically lots and lots of volunteers. They may be doing it on company dime, uh, but still uh, they're working there as individuals, and there's no single overarching company behind the distribution. Unlike, for example, in Fedora's case, where Red Hat is the prime uh, contributor behind that. 
Uh, in Debian, there's tons and tons of different packages available. Uh, there's, uh, based on uh, Debian org's uh, front page, they have like 59,000 uh, different packages available. So that would uh, mean that they basically have coverage of pretty much all the free software out there. Not really, but close enough that it doesn't make a difference. Uh, also, there's lots of Debian derivatives, uh, Ubuntu being the most famous one. Uh, but um, that basically means that there's a lot of people who know how Debian and Debian derivatives actually work. Uh, but anyway, it turns out that Debian is not quite the perfect fit for us. Um, basically, in the stable, especially back then when uh, earlier Debian release had been few and far between, uh, it meant that uh, Basically, you either need to start backporting stuff, uh, or you have to live with the old packages, uh, which we really didn't want to do for various reasons. And once you actually got far enough behind the curve, uh, so you actually needed to start uh, backporting system uh, components, uh, then uh, it really didn't. It really wasn't fun anymore because then you actually needed to do lots and lots of work that you'd rather have somebody else doing, which was the whole reason for the thing. Also, once you actually go down that path, you're not really running Debian itself. You're actually running a custom distro, which is just fine. No worries there. But the thing is. Uh, uh, why did you want to go with the stable system in the first place? Uh, didn't you want the thing to be something that other people have proven and battle tested over time? Uh, anyway, it was basically, uh, our, we had really bad experiences on having to do backporting for ages and we really didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, then the other thing is, um, uh, uh, like the system D hula baloo back in the day, uh, when they were choosing in its uh, uh, like which init system should be the default, even though system D was available as a package for quite a while before then, uh, we still felt that the integration wasn't quite there. Uh, a lot of the packages still had init v sysv init uh, scripts there and lacked system D unit files uh, for some time. And on the whole, it was, um, at the time, it really wasn't that well integrated with systemd, which was definitely something we wanted to use already back then. Uh, so uh, then we started looking at the alternatives. So eventually, we basically ended up with Fedora. But there were a couple of others, but the basic Fedora was uh, pretty early on the uh, main contender. Uh, it, Fedora has a six-month release cycle. Well, uh, that's well slipping every now and then, but still a six-month-ish uh, release cycle, uh, which sounded a bit scary for us at first because uh, that means that we need to uh, can be continuously updating because Fedora supports the current distro uh, release and then the one uh, the one before that, and basically the one before that only gets two months of uh, overlapping support. Uh, so there's a, you need to at least once a year, basically, to be thinking of uh, upgrading. And if you don't do that, then you are, well, out of luck as, uh, as far as it comes to security patches and whatnot. Um, anyway, um, the upside of this is, of course, that everything is fairly fresh. You don't need to backport a lot of stuff, especially you don't need to backport system libraries or system components, which is great because you don't really want to do that. Uh, but on the other hand, we as a database as a service company, we actually still need to build plenty of packages to, in order to be able to fix customer uh, found bugs or new minor releases of things or whatnot. But there's basically a tons of things that we still need to package. But um, instead of it being thousands of packages, now we're like left with like 150 or so packages, which is great. Uh, so uh, basically, it sounded like something we wanted to go with. And the other thing was that I mentioned about systemd. Systemd has been in Fedora for quite a while, for well, for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, it's also well integrated, and it's basically been the default for quite some time, and it really works fairly well. Another, by the way, anecdotal thing is uh, uh, my Pulse Audio setup on Debian never worked, but it worked out of the box on Fedora, so uh, <laughs> there's that. But uh, anyway, it's uh, not quite related to us choosing Fedora. Well, sort of. Uh, anyway, the, also the RPM spec files, uh, the way you build RPM packages, it's much, much nicer than building Debian packages. Uh, this is my personal opinion, but let's really take that to the bank. That's like true. Uh, anyway, but I really recommend like building RPM specs rather than actually doing it the Debian way. Of course, there's a, not one way. Of, well, there's an official way of doing it in Debian, but there's like ten other ways of uh, 
creating dev packages too. Anyway, um, anyway, what you get out of uh, the box with Fedora uh, is um, you get an up-to-date kernel and systemd with the kernel, by the way, it also gets updated over time. So it, you're not actually stuck with running whatever was the released version uh, back then. So you're actually running something fairly recent, uh, as in recent being like uh, the kernel release from the last month or so. So you're actually getting fairly fresh stuff. Um, then systemd support uh, is there out of the box. It really does work well. Uh, there haven't been any issues around that, that for, except for a couple of systemd bugs. Then you get SE Linux, which is also integrated fairly well into the system and works. Uh, we haven't really had any issues with that over the years. Then there are the firewalls there, uh, but in general, um, okay, this is by the way a difference to Debian packaging, um, like philosophy, if you will. Uh, when you install Debian package, let's say you install Postgres packages, uh, by default it actually uh, starts uh, the server uh, and binds it to port X, whatever the default is, and starts uh, that usually is a public interface, and then it starts serving stuff. Of course, at this point, you don't really have any useful configuration for it or anything else. But uh, we much preferred, uh, like when we install a package, it abs does absolutely nothing until we tell it uh, tell System D to actually start start the thing off. Uh, but this is like uh, one nice thing that's uh, usually not mentioned anywhere. Also, these days it has the latest um, Python, but on the other hand, it has uh, had the latest Python forever. And but the version number was just different back then. Uh, so we're he like a heavily uh, Python uh, using house. So we have lots of code. Uh, well, we have some code uh, using Go and Java and C, but uh, the major the vast majority, 90 something percent, is Python for us. Um, Anyway, then a word about the topic. Uh, so ger generally speaking, our philosophy on nodes, uh, which by the way, in, for this purpose of this talk, are basically either a virtual machine or a bare metal machine. We don't really distinguish between those. Uh, anyway, the idea is that they're disposable. So uh, we don't care if they go away. We expect them to go away en masse uh, around the planet all the time. Uh, the other thing is um, um, we really don't put any manual effort into any given single node. Uh, basically, we do everything by automation, uh, and that's been the case for quite a while. Uh, the other thing is um, we operate in six different public clouds, and they all have different um, ways of doing things. So, whoopsie. Uh, so, uh, we don't try not to rely on their uh, functionality too much. Uh, so we even from things like uh, disk encryption uh, and so forth, we actually use locks for that instead of using the cloud providers provided uh, functionality. Uh, in general, our uh, like uh, integration towards the cloud providers is fairly minimalistic. But anyway, there's also uh, there's another side of the coin uh, because of the way we do persistence, which I'll go into in a bit, is uh, it allows us to use things like local SSDs. So uh, typically with uh, many of our competitors, what you're using is network SSDs, so EBS volumes or uh, Google's persistent uh, disks or uh, Azure's premium SSDs. Uh, but they're all basically, because of the speed of light, they have uh, severe limitations on uh, how well they perform compared to uh, local SSDs that are basically PCI Express NVMe devices that are uh, connected directly to the machine. Uh, that gives us some um, performance benefits. Uh, anyway, the idea behind durability is also that we always have the data somewhere else than the actual node. Uh, so the idea behind this is that if the node get, um, dies for whatever reason, which they frequently do, uh, it's th still not a biggie. Um, anyway, word about uh, persistence and durability. Uh, so. Uh, so anyway, we, we try not to rely on EBS volumes, persistent uh, uh, disks, or premium SSDs for persistence. You can't easily move them between clouds. So one of our value props is that you can actually move your services with a couple of clicks between clouds. So instead of having a migration project, you can just say that I want my service, which is in AWS EU West 1, moved to uh, US East 1 or uh, wherever you want to move it. Uh, I'll go uh, further on into the details how we do that. Uh, but anyway, you, since you can't easily move these actual uh, disks that are network attached, uh, the, we basically solved the issue another way around. Uh, but the a nice thing is, well, since we actually are using local SSDs because we're handling the persistence in a slightly different way, is um, 
Uh, like here's just some uh, ex like example numbers, but uh, an EBS volume can do roughly 250 megs. Uh, or uh, let's let's just go with reads. It's simpler. They have different uh, characteristics for reads and writes. But if you just go with reads. Uh, it's basically 250 megs, uh, uh, and then it can do roughly 10k uh, IOPS, from what I remember. Uh, uh, then on another hand, like AWS, the same cloud vendors, uh, i3 machines, which have local SSDs, uh, they can do like north of 2 gigs a second. It's actually closer to 3 gigs a second. And then on read IOPS, you can get into millions uh, range. So it's on a completely different ballpark uh, when it comes to uh, hardware characteristics. Um, then, uh, here's an example of how we do persistence for Postgres, for example. So uh, we have a thing called PG Horde, which was originally written by yours truly. Uh, it's basically a Postgres backup daemon, which is on GitHub and uh, the second or third most popular one based on GitHub stars for Postgres. Basically what it does, it uh, like it takes your write-ahead log, uh, it compresses, and, uh, compresses the data, encrypts it, and uh, then sends it to object store. This basically gives us a bounded data loss window, uh, which is OK, uh, but this is still isn't great. But for all our HA services, basically, uh, the customer gets to choose whether the data is synchronously or asynchronously replicated. So basically, they get to choose uh, how much uh, performance uh, loss are they willing to accept. Uh, but basically, with this, you can get arbitrarily low uh, data loss windows depending on a single uh, node loss. Also, since we uh, uh, provision these uh, in all the different cloud vendors. Every one of those which has multiple availability zones, we automatically spread the nodes of a given service. So if you have a Kafka cluster or a Postgres service or Elasticsearch cluster, we always split those into multiple AZs. And we also make sure that in the case of clustered systems like Kafka, if you have uh, n copies of a um, uh, partition, uh, they are always sp split among the different availability zones automatically. Um, anyway, our approach to upgrades is basically that we do rolling forward upgrades. Uh, so basically, uh, when you have, a, let's say, a three-node Kafka cluster, or, what the, or uh, let's say a three-node Elasticsearch cluster, what happens is that we side by side those, we create three new virtual machines, replicate the data over, and do a controlled failover without any downtime for the customer. And uh, that's pretty much the way we do all our software upgrades uh, or hardware upgrades. So the same thing is being used whether you uh, upgrade, let's say you have three machines that all have eight gigs of memory, a couple of CPUs, and X amount of disk. Uh, if you upgrade to a larger plan, what happens is we again create the uh, uh, a bunch of new nodes, replicate the data there, and then basically do failovers there. And this happens the same way whether we change between cloud providers, or I mean, if you're moving from AWS US East 1 to Google's uh, South Carolina data center, we basically just use the exact same methodology again and again. Uh, so basically, once uh, the actual nodes are up and running, we actually never uh, uh, touch them again. Uh, and we also do this at a huge scale. Uh, it's been fairly useful to actually have just a single way of doing this. We've had our share of issues with this, but happily there's only one way of, for us to do any upgrade, so we really rehearse this a lot. Um, and then a word about systemd nspawn versus Docker. Uh, basically, uh, Docker comes with its own set of baggage. There are some philosophical things uh, which we disagree, uh, mostly like having a single process per uh, container. Uh, I mean, you can get around it, but still, that's the uh, general uh, tendency. But also things like systemd and spawn is actually part of the system that you're already using. Uh, it's like uh, already there. It's built in. Uh, it's also... Uh, much more minimal, minimalistic and doesn't come with all that much stuff, but it works fairly well. And in the case of uh, how, how we build images, our container images are basically just directory trees, uh, more or less. I mean, they may come in tarball or compressed format or whatnot, but they're essentially just directory trees. And the other thing is nSpawn integrates really well with systemd, which is uh, pretty neat for us because we can then control uh, stuff from outside the container with uh, systemd itself. We use unit files for a lot of things and a lot of different directives in those, and then we use journalD and its structured logging quite a bit. Uh, and both have been like really 
good for us. Then a word about the host machine. Um, the host machine in our case, where we are running our customer service, is also running Fedora. Uh, there's also a single container on the same VM or, or well, node, so basically bare metal machine or VM. And uh, there's a bunch of things that are running on it. So uh, once um, we provision a VM, we install our management agent there. Well, the first thing it does, it actually uh, uh, tries to refresh the package it has. So, um, we're basically doing this so that we can have immediate control for, uh, over any new nodes, even before we build new images, which we do frequently. So we uh, like build our images a lot. But on the other hand, if we want to say, let's say, that you cannot have version X of uh, Postgres package because we decide that, OK, this one sucks, before we can actually roll it out to 89 different cloud regions around the world, that takes a while. Depending on the cloud vendor, it may take quite a bit of time. Uh, so we actually have uh, created this mechanism so just we can, uh, just uh, like five minutes later, uh, um, like uh, when we create the next node, we can just uh, control the, like specifically what kind of packages are, is it getting. Um, typically, there's nothing to do at this step. Uh, it's just uh, uh, like um, typically uh, the images that are there are already good enough, but it's basically an emergency handbrake. Uh, anyway, after this point, after it's installed the packages that it needs for the customer service, uh, the machines are immutable. They really aren't changing for the duration of the lifetime of that node again. We do have uh, the ability to manually go there and uh, install stuff, but we, it's not really done ever. It's basically only for debugging purposes if we need to do something uh, weird. Then the management agent starts up, which we call Prune, which is uh, apparently some sort of plum tree or something. Uh, we came up with the name from somewhere, which I forget. Uh, uh, basically what it does, it sets up the machine to operate uh, the customer service, so uh, sets up the disk layout with raids and uh, encryption, sets up, uh, uh, basically they, all the cluster nodes talk to each other over I, uh, IPv6 over IPsec, and then it basically restores the data of either from backups, which are often object stores, or then the other way around, they could be uh, restoring the data from other nodes in the cluster, uh, in the case, uh, depending on the type of cluster that we're serving. And then it typically keeps our monitoring and reporting the health of the system. And there's also other ways of doing that, but it also keeps a general sense of uh, the thing is still healthy and there's a heartbeat coming out of it. Uh, it also reacts to configuration changes. Uh, so when we add a new node, we need to create IPsec tunnels to those. We need to uh, change cluster configuration and different uh, database services. And uh, then there's also the customers are allowed to change some configuration parameters in different services. So we allow users to configure Postgres, some Postgres settings. So those, uh, while the packages themselves are immutable, there's, uh, the data files on disk are obviously changing with, uh, well, the database. The other thing is, uh, of course, the configuration may change uh, within those post like Postgres columns, but otherwise it's completely immutable. And then the, uh, like the management agent actually sets up a bunch of auxiliary uh, agents. Uh, all of those run on the host side. There's basically some, uh, we collect metrics, uh, oh crap. Uh, we collect uh, metrics out of the system and we collect tons and tons of metrics. Uh, so there's like ton, tons of uh, data points coming out of those. Then we are shipping the logs from journal also in structured format, so we actually, are able to search through those, and we basically re retain the structure of the logs that we basically put in there, and we also use structured logging for this. Then there are also backup and uh, HA daemons like PG Horde, which I mentioned, that are largely we've open sourced over time. Uh, the, the one we haven't is actually Cassandra's, and we're hoping to do that too, but the, when we implemented it, actually it started relying on some of our internal things, uh, and uh, now we need to write it uh, slightly in a slightly different manner. Uh, we, besides actually uh, selling uh, Apache Kafka as a service, we actually use it internally a lot. So we have tons and tons of Apache Kafka clusters, and we are basically, the, all of these nodes and all of these uh, daemons are actually talking to Kafka. And all the configuration changes coming from users are basically being sent over Kafka to these nodes. Okay. Um. Yeah, uh, then there's the container in those machines or, or nodes. Uh, it's basically run through a fairly locked down systemd and spawn. Uh, it basically contains 
only the customer user services, so things like Postgres or Apache Kafka or Elasticsearch or uh, what have you. And none of these actually allow code execution. So it's actually um, like we haven't taken a single uh, service type into use which would allow arbitrary um, user uh, code execution. Basically, we are lacking uh, like a really good sandbox for that. There's a couple of uh, interesting ones like Gvisor and uh, like Firecracker uh, that uh, we've been looking at, but currently we don't allow any code execution. Uh, it's not that it's actually that bad if somebody actually managed to uh, like get uh, into their own machine. Uh, there's nothing that secret there, but it's just something that uh, we'd rather people not shoot themselves in the foot uh, with, uh, with a foot gun. Anyway, uh, after installation, the container again is totally immutable except for the config files, which may change, like Postgres conf, you may get the user options there, and we don't really want to rebuild the whole service again uh, just to get like a new configuration switch that has different number in it and the data files that the database itself is actually writing to. Uh, then word about image building. Um, so we support the, uh, six different cloud providers, and they all have a different way of, for you to register new images and how you do this. Some like DigitalOcean actually uh, only have pre-built images that you can only take snapshots of uh, after you change them. So you can't actually upload your own images at all. Uh, so. Uh, we basically had to uh, make sure that our uh, tooling works uh, with all of them. Uh, then uh, some public clouds are fairly slow in, uh, when you're operating with them and creating uh, like base images, and especially when you're transferring it to uh, all the regions of that cloud provider. And the, way, the ways we do those are basically cloud dependent. Uh, there's nothing really shared between the clouds. So they just have very differing implementations of how you do that. Uh, anyway, now we have, uh, I think it's like 89 cloud regions, wh uh, what we currently support among the six different public cloud vendors. Uh, anyway, the pre-installed packages that we put on the images, uh, they, some of them are actually fairly large, so uh, they actually do take some disk space. Uh, but the idea behind this is that why we pre-install them and make the, the images themselves already contain this stuff is so that the, when we spin up a new node, which we do a lot, uh, they basically are uh, much faster ready to serve the customers and their needs. Uh, and then depending on the cloud provider, again, like things like Google uh, are fairly fast and things like Azure are fairly slow in booting up. Uh, uh, AWS being somewhere in the middle, uh, it, uh, they usually take somewhere between two minutes to ten minutes from the call, time we call the API on the cloud provider side saying, please give me a VM with specs like X. Anyway, testing. Um, because we do a lot of these updates, so basically we follow Fedora's release cycle mostly, uh, we basically have tons and tons of uh, like uh, testing, we have unit tests, system tests, chaos tests, whatever kind of tests. Uh, uh, but the thing is, oftentimes when we've actually hit problems, it hasn't been um, something that tests a particular uh, version of something, it's actually just a generic test that starts failing, and then we go investigate it, and okay, it's because something changed somewhere. Uh, but it's... Uh, if you want to do uh, follow a fast changing distribution, you really need like a fairly wide coverage test suit. That's my opinion, at least. Uh, or otherwise, you're basically sailing blind. I'm not saying that our test suit couldn't be better. It could definitely be much much better, uh, but it uh, still has uh, like found lots of different issues. Uh, the other thing is uh, with our approach, you're basically uh, eating. Uh, like basically uh, enduring quite a bit of pain all the time, but the other way around is if you do this every three years or four years or five years or whatever, what have you, uh, there's basically a lot of pain when you actually do have to eventually move to the next version of the distro. Uh, so we're basically rather we'd rather like have a, quite a bit of pain all the time instead of having an immense amount of pain uh, every X years. And the other thing is that we, you really should be reading the release notes of everything uh, with a magnifying class. Um, it hasn't always been smooth sailing. Uh, like recently, uh, uh, glibc changed their Unicode collections and 
we got hit by this uh, because we, while we were aware that it's changing, uh, we weren't aware that Fedora had backported the change to the previous version of glibc. Uh, so uh, that came as a bit of a surprise for us, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's something that uh, we should have read with, uh, more carefully from the release notes because it was definitely mentioned there. Uh, then also IPsec in the kernel or in the tooling keeps on breaking all the time, which uh, in 2019 I'd rather it actually just worked, but we still have issues. Of course, the other thing is we're using it uh, on the public internet where the networks are uh, uh, not that great, which means that we're probably, uh, we're by the way exposing a lot of these to an environment where they're typically not designed to be uh, used. Originally, things like Apache Kafka were used in uh, in-house data centers where the networks were stable and everything was good. In the public clouds, the networks aren't great and uh, you keep on having issues all the time by losing nodes or uh, having net splits or whatnot. And then one of the other annoying things is that DNF is a bit on the slow side. Happily, there's going to be some improvements on this, but uh, it's really also not really resilient against temporary network errors, so we actually use a wrapper around it. But in general, we're very happy with Fedora, and it's allowed us to actually focus on what we're doing instead of actually backporting stuff again. And uh, it's also, basically, through the way we're doing this, it also forced us to de-emphasize the meaning of any single node. So we really, uh, if a node go and lo and gets lost, that's fine. The other thing is, uh, we basically just need to take care of persistence another way, because we don't really care about the uh, particular nodes anymore. And if you want to do this, you, j you really, really want to automate pretty much everything. Any questions? The first X questions get socks. So. Uh, by the way, everybody who has a question, come to me later and I'll find you the socks. Uh, there's. Okay, well, there are people in the audience with socks. Run C and OCI um, uh, OCI structure, uh, you know, uh, files, um, and also, um, yeah, that's my one question. Really, uh, we could use something like Run C, but back in back in the day, it actually didn't exist. Uh, how long? How long ago was 2015. this? 2015. Oh, okay. So it, it, it didn't exist. Uh, like, uh, and besides, I think actually a system DN spawn is actually uh, uh, like trying to actually be able to run OCI uh, directly. Uh, but on the other hand, what we're actually looking for next is actually better sandboxing rather than uh, <coughs> like. My my second question is what uh, what language is pruned written in, and, and are there any interesting mechanics in that that orchestration? piece? Uh, it's actually written in Python, and uh, well, mo yeah, it's written in Python. Uh, well, I'm not sure how, well, it does a lot of or, uh, like uh, interesting orchestration, but it's also part of the proprietary uh, secret sauce of ours. I mean, we're happy to open source a lot of the tools we're working on, but you, that's uh, pretty, uh, like also some of the stuff that we actually do. What's the database you choose to use for <laughs> uh, It actually doesn't use internally. It's basically run on every node. It doesn't have a database of its own, but the, what we use for our management things is actually Postgres. So, uh, I'm a long-time uh, Postgres fan, and uh, uh, like all the founders had written some uh, uh, small piece of code to Postgres back in the day, so we're heavily uh, into Postgres. So you picked uh, Fedora for its release cycle, and because it was up to date, why not go even further? And, and uh, rawhide. Pick, yeah. Uh, there's only so much pain that we can take. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, rawhide, like back in the day, it used to be even wilder. These days, it's actually settled down, in my opinion. But uh, you still have to draw a line somewhere. Any other questions? Okay. Or, okay. Uh, how do you react to a host going down? Because if you use disk encryption, it can't, or I, I assume it can't come back on its own, do you then just spin up a new host uh, or no? We typically spin up a new host once it's been unresponsive for X amount of time. Uh, they all send heartbeats over actually Kafka, 
and we actually have a fairly good um, idea when a node goes down. And we actively monitor for things like ACP events. So uh, if, a cloud, if a cloud provider deems to actually, um, they will actually want to tell us that the node is going away, we get uh, like notice beforehand. Usually they don't, they just vanish, but uh, some of them are nicer in this regard than others. Uh. You mentioned GVisor. Um, do you use it? I mean, do you use uh, it? We've been uh, looking at it. Uh, we don't currently use it, but it's something we've been looking actively at. Uh, also, the Firecracker thing is another uh, similar thing. The problem with Firecracker in our case is actually that uh, uh, you can't actually run uh, it on uh, other instances that aren't bare metal. So in the case of AWS, that sucks. In the case of uh, GCP and Azure, they actually allow you to run things like uh, KVM on KVM, uh, but you can't do it on AWS. Yeah, like uh, the talk is mostly uh, it's mostly about state management, and uh, you solve the problem by having the application having some sort of clustering. Are there any other demons that do not support clustering on their own, and you have some tooling to get the state from there and sync it with some other places? Uh, yes. So we. Uh, uh, it's a fairly broad question, but yes, so yes, we do. Uh, come talk to me after this if you want some more details. Okay. Uh, you said you didn't use, um, uh, or that you used Lux. How do you deal with key management without using KMS services? Uh, so for us, the keys are actually transient in the sense that they only have the life cycle of the node. So once the node is gone, uh, that's it. We don't go back to the nodes that are gone. And um, would God include a reboot? Uh, we don't actually, even reboots from our point of view are basically the node is gone and we replace it. Yeah, th um, so any other questions? I think I'm running over time. Um, cutting into that, uh, I assume that if you restart a node somewhere, then it also needs data. So how do you provision the initial data? Uh, so it was here somewhere. Uh, but the, the answer is uh, depends on the service type. And the question, in the case of Postgres, we typically restore everything from object store up until the point of the very latest data, and that we actually replicate from the uh, other hosts in the uh, cluster. But if you provision from like an object store, then you need secrets or authentication or that kind of yes, stuff. Yes, so all of, this is, uh, all of this is encrypted. Uh, so basically, we do client side encryption. Uh, we have the keys for the encrypted data in the object stores, obviously. And we basically just restore that. Uh, we use things like PG Hoard or My Hoard or uh, others like that. So uh, those are all open source on GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I think that's it. If you have any other questions, uh, please find me after this. Uh, thank you very much.